Hello. Hello, lovely. Thank you for popping in. You're welcome. Anytime. <laughs> Would you like me to talk about your book? Would you show me <laughs> to talk about your book? <laughs> well, for those that don't know, why don't you tell us what your book's about? Oh, bless you. Uh, it's a story of love, hope and longing set on the edge of a 400 foot cliff, a real one by Beachy Head, just 10 minutes over there from where I live. Stunning, absolutely stunning landscape um, where everybody who walks along that cliff feels like they're suspended somehow between the sea and the sky. And into that landscape comes this um, woman, uh, Sarah, teacher in her early 30s, who's caught in this horrible moment that I know by proxy so well, where she's had her last shot at IVF and trying to have a baby, can't afford it anymore, and has to wait for two weeks to see whether the treatments work. It's a terrible, terrible moment. And in that moment, she has run away to her safe place, which is the South Downs, um, to face what's coming on her own. Uh, her lover, Jack, kind of gets the wrong idea and thinks that she might be going to jump because that's one of the things that the place is known for. So he comes down desperately trying to find her. And then they both come into contact with this guy who's living in a lighthouse on the edge of the cliff, who's known at the beginning just as the keeper, who, um, as the catch line on the book says, you know, he knows only too well that sometimes love takes you to the edge. So, you know, that's what it is. That's what it's about. It sounds to me like you, it's slightly autobiographical because you keep saying, you know, I know a little bit about this story. It's based where you live. So is it your story? No, it's not my story. I mean, there are definitely things in there that I know about from experience. I, um, like what it's like to go through IVF and fertility treatment for a long time and think that you're not going to have children. Um, and the awful uh, trouble that causes in your own head and between you as a couple is that I also, you know, I do live here. We see the helicopters, we see the lifeboats go out. And I've spoken many times to the chaplains who patrol the edge of the cliff. The wonderful volunteers are there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, saving people's lives. So we know Beachy Head as a place of sorrow and despondency as a reality. But we also know it as a place of absolute beauty, stunning, stunning beauty. Wide open landscape with a horizon so wide you can see the curvature of the earth. Uh, and the weather changes, you know, four times an hour. Um, and in, in lockdown, being able to live here and walk up there has been a lifesaver, really, in lots of ways. So I know that Beachy Head is both, you know, dangerous and stunningly beautiful and an inspirational place and a place where sometimes it feels like, you know, the divine is possible. So all of that is from experience. But the people aren't me. I'm not any one of them. Uh, some of them are composites of people I know, and some of them are, I just made them up. Out your head. Out my head, yeah. Tell me about Sarah. Okay, well. What person is she? Um, I mean, she's, she's absolutely lovely. She's a, she's a teacher um, in the East End. Again, something I kind of know about. And she's been trying to have a child for a very long time. Uh, somewhere along her story has got mixed up um she she comes from a, a a church background her her dad's a vicar and her granny um once told her the story of abraham and sarah in you know in jewish and christian tradition um and she got a bit mixed up with it and kind of understood that it meant for her that she was never going to have kids so she she's got a, a bit of a, a problem at the back of her head about it all and she's just caught in this awful moment and she can't get out of it and she just has to wait to see what happens. And, and there's also something else going on for her, which in that awful moment, she kind of has to decide whether she can survive and how she can get through it. Not about whether she has a baby or not, but whether she can survive the moment and thrive regardless of whether the pregnancy test is positive or negative. And so she's up on the hill trying to get away from Jack, her old man, and just full of longing, really. There's a lot of that. She sounds lost. Is she lost? No, no. I think she's in very difficult circumstances. 
And I think she's suspended, like the lighthouse is suspended, like the, everybody who walks on the edge is suspended. But I think that she has enormous resources. Uh, she's imaginative and creative and compassionate and engaging. And she has to find a way through this very, very difficult moment. Um, but, you know, I think she will. Well, I know she will. Because <laughs> I wrote it. Because you wrote it. <laughs> You'll forgive me, I hope, for saying uh, it. it doesn't uh, sound right cheerful. Actually, <laughs> I, know, I know what you're saying, love. I know what Cliff you're saying. Tops, failed IVF, <laughs> it all sounds a bit maudlin. Yeah, it does. I get you. <laughs> but it really isn't. And one of the reasons it isn't is because this place in which it happens is so beautiful, it's so spectacular that to be there as as a couple of them say you know there's no more beautiful place in the world on a, on a gorgeous day um like today i've got the curtains closed blocking out the sun but it's wonderful out there so it's an uplifting place in that respect and this is an uplifting story because it's a story about hope and redemption and about the possibility of change and although things are bleak and people are suspended at the beginning we do see things shift and we do think see people dare to hope that change will come and we do see change come so um somebody this morning uh, on twitter said that it was um warm and uplifting so there so that's all right so there yeah big shout and out uh, by the way to david nichols the author of sweet sorrows and us and um um one day sorry david who uh, tweeted about it as well this morning said it was lyrical and romantic so that's brilliant but that's not that's not the only good reviews you've had because you've had some l lovely people say some lovely things about this book including the reverend kate botley she's a smasher <laughs> yes absolutely uh, anthony horowitz that was good um matt haig who wrote reasons to stay alive um and the humans wonderful wonderful writer uh, Jane Fallon, fantastic novelist. She's had a lot of bestsellers. Marianne Power, who wrote a book called Help Me, which is a, a wonderful book. She lived for a year trying to live through self-help books. <laughs> it's not a spoiler to say it didn't go terribly well at the beginning. Um, yeah, so, so fabulous people uh, who've read it. Geoffrey Archer. Now, I mean, you know, Geoffrey Archer, whatever you say about Geoffrey Archer, he knows how to tell a story. And he said that it had tremendous speed and pace. I can remember these things off, off heart, isn't it terrible? <laughs> you lay awake at night, Geoffrey Archer said, Geoffrey Archer said. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Repeating it to yourself. Yeah, tremendous speed and pace. The ending took me completely by surprise, which, you know, for the King of Twists is, is, is quite something. It's quite something. Now, you were talking a little bit ago about um, the biblical story mm. um, that resonates in the book. It's not a book that's, shy of talking about god is it? it it does have that in it yeah well it's a, it's a book in which uh in the, in the story as in my life the possibility of the divine is real however you want to describe that however you want to engage with it whether you want to engage with it through a traditional faith or none the the possibility that the divine is there is a real thing in the story as it is for me in life and that place up there is a, what they call a thin place. You'll know exactly what I mean by that. Uh, but it's one of those places where the barrier between what we feel is real and what might be or what's imagined or what might be the next world or the spiritual world seems, you know, absolutely paper thin. And that landscape sometimes, uh, when the weather shifts or, the, or, the, or, the, the, or it goes a certain way, it's like walking through a dream and you wonder whether it's all real. So... Um, there is a kind of dreamlike element to it, but there's also a part of the story which is about the possibility of miracles happening for people. And when they do, whether they're a bit complicated, whether they're a bit painful, whether they're a bit difficult to understand and whether they're a bit elusive. So all of that plays in. And as an example of that, Sarah's story that I was relating to earlier, Abraham and Sarah, in Jewish and Christian tradition. I think you'd know more than I would, but it's about 4,000 years old, isn't it, that story? Is that about right? Sounds about right. So they're in, a, you know, they're in their caravan 
in the sense, not, not in the sense of <laughs> Kaaba sands, in the, in the sense of tents in the desert. And, and got a static and be a bit posh. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Got a chemical loop. And, 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 and she's in her 90s, I think, and completely given up on the idea of having a baby. And he is also old, and they've had a disastrous attempt at surrogacy, and it hasn't worked. And, and she's, you know, really fed up about it. And then this stranger comes, who is enigmatic, it might be an angel, might be God, who knows, but it's a stranger, comes and says, when I come back in a year's time, you're going to have a baby. And Sarah, who's in the shadows, of course, because that's part of the patriarchy at that time, in the shadows, laughs. And the, and the stranger goes, you know, what, what are you laughing at? And you know what? I've heard loads of men preach about that moment and dismiss that laughter. But for me, that laughter is one of the most beautiful moments in Jewish or Christian scriptures because it's so truthful. It's so straight from the heart. It's like, you must be joking. You know, give me a break. How dare you come here and start chatting shit for me? Right? I mean, that's not a literal translation. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so there's that moment. And, and then Sarah, who is, as I say, in her 90s, then has this thing that she has to decide. Right, the old man has been having dreams and visions and talking about changing his name, talking about becoming the father of nations. And then this stranger has turned up and said this thing which is totally disconcerting. And she has to decide whether to completely disregard it all as lunatic or whether there's just a glimmer of it that she can hold on to and say, do you know what, maybe change is possible. And I sort of use that story to underpin the story of Sarah in the present day who knows that story she's brought up in that kind of background and she, as I say she has to decide in all the lunacy that is around IVF and fertility treatment and the mental stress that, that is involved perhaps not lunacy but stress she has to decide whether there is a glimmer of something that she can hold on to and a hope for change beyond whether or not she has a baby but whether she can thrive and survive and go to the next place she needs to be so you know what I'm trying to say, Kate, is is that it, that I read that Abraham and story, Abraham and Sarah story from four thousand years ago, as a story about people who are caught up in a in a in a dramatic story, but also have the possibility of the divine all around them. And I see Jack and Sarah in the present day in the same way. Now, the fact that we're on Zoom and the length of my fringe tells oh. us that we're in lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> Could you not just get some kitchen scissors? Well, I keep thinking am I and then I, I just sort of chicken out at the last minute I quite like it it's gone a bit Claudia Winkleman um anyway there's, that's there's nothing, wrong with, that. there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with that, that. Um, you see the dog's <clears throat> foot by the way what the dog's foot oh hello mate look at that right, you look. um that's uh, all those gray hairs all over the deep blue sofa <laughs> I know right <laughs> never mind it'll be fine we'll get some sellotape on it um as you lock down and mm. what have been the benefits and the disadvantages of this coming out in paperback right now more people have got more time to read right yeah yeah you would hope so if they can get the books i mean one of the one of the disadvantages is that some places haven't got it stocked some amazing bookshops um are closed or are having trouble getting hold of books for now support your local bookshop um so that's a disadvantage uh but other otherwise yeah people are, are ready for stories and also you know, we're all longing for space to breathe and wander and think, and we're all longing for beauty, particularly, you know, if you're stuck in a, a flat with, with no outdoor space or just a park that's a bit crowded. I, you know, and I, I'm lucky enough to have the downs. I can't tell you how extraordinary that is. Um, but I think this story will take you there. You know, it just opens up the landscape to you in your head. I'll take you on a little wander with your brain um, together. Um, and it also, as I was trying to say earlier, contains the possibility that there's more to life than our circumstances, that, you know, that things can change and transform and shift and that hope is possible. So that's why I think people should read it. I think that's probably as good a place as any. Hope is possible. That sounds like something we should put on a post and put a rainbow above it. <laughs> Stick it in the window. All right, I'll do that if you will. <laughs> OK, it's a deal. All right. Thank you. You're welcome anytime. Brilliant. All right. See you soon. Bye. See you soon. Take care. Thanks for chatting. You know what? It's the, it's the modern legend, isn't it? The modern 
catchphrase. How do you turn this thing off? <laughs> no, we can't hear you. No, I can't tell you how many people's know up, up people's noses. In fact, it don't feel like a proper Zoom meeting unless I've showed you my nostrils. <laughs> yeah, and on that note, I might leave. <laughs> See ya. Thank you. Bye.